Oh no, do you hear that? You know, whenever they start playing that song, it's not gonna end well. So I just finished Mike Flanagan's latest Netflix horror, Midnight Mass, and now I need to explain to my mom why there's a bunch of used tissues next to my computer. I think this might help me in this video, but my dad, grandfather, and great-grandfather were all ministers, so please show them I made the right career choice by hitting that like and subscribe button, because in this video, there's a ton to unpack. Like, why do some people resurrect and others do not? Is the angel actually an angel, and what happened to it? I'll also be pinpointing some cool Easter eggs, like did you catch this shot of the Joubert home? Joubert was the villain in Mike Flanagan's Gerald's Game based on the book by Stephen King. And yes, we are going to be diving into some pretty heavy subject matter, breaking down Flanagan's interpretation of what heaven, God, and the afterlife really is. Because let's be real, the first time I listened to Aaron's speech, I nearly spontaneously combusted. It's a lot to take in. So grab a couple glasses of communion wine and indulge in the body of Christ, because we're about to embark on a wild ride. The final episode is titled Revelation. In fact, every episode is named after a book in the Bible. Revelation is fitting not only because it's the final book, but that it depicts the rapture, or end of the world. And that's exactly what the inhabitants of Crockett Island are facing. We open on St. Patrick's Catholic Church on Easter Sunday. This is a quite interesting patron saint, as he is known as the patron saint of carrying the cross and banishing both serpents and demons. As you can see, this Easter service has gone about as well as the time I brought my ex girl girlfriend back to meet my parents. What occurred here is nothing more than a midnight mass occur. <laughs> a botched event that was supposed to see God's new covenant for the world, a covenant which would see bloodthirsty vampires take over as the dominant species on earth, a world where there is no more death. God still has a plan, and death isn't part of it anymore. Not for all of us. But Father Paul, the church's leader, hides a terrible secret. That's not his name at all. The big reveal in episode 3 is that Father Paul is the 80-year-old Monsignor John Pruitt who supposedly fell ill while visiting the Holy Land. Also, I think this is director Mike Flanagan in a brief cameo. Sorry, Mike, if that's not you. A semi-dementia-ridden Pruitt, which for those of you who are curious, the name Pruitt means brave little one, got lost while on the road to Damascus and stumbled into the desert. A sandstorm forced him to seek refuge in an ancient ruin, which he describes as being a church. However, whether it's a church for God or something else isn't entirely confirmed. There he uncovers what he calls an angel, an angel who attacks him, feeds off him, then miraculously brings Paul back to life and de-aging him about 40 plus years. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I never remember reading about blood-sucking angels in Sunday school. To keep this miracle a secret, Pruitt decides to lock the angel in a trunk and travel back to Crockett Island posing as the fictitious Father Paul. Paul is a fitting name for him since that was the name Saul took when he went on the road to Damascus, and he later became one of Jesus' apostles. Like Saul, Pruitt became Paul. For reasons of clarity, for the rest of the video I'll be referring to him as Paul since that's what he's called for the majority of his screen time. Paul ends up locking the angel in a trunk and bringing him to the island. It's never explained how he's able to get the angel into the trunk, especially considering how strong we'll see the angel is, but it's entirely possible the angel wanted to be taken from his confines in the ruins and, as we'll see throughout the series, Paul and the angel seem to have an understanding with one another. With the angel successfully on Crockett Island, it's only a matter of time before some strange things occur. Dozens of dead cats wash ashore after a storm. These cats were actually killed by the angel, who Paul has let out at night to feed. Their bodies have washed ashore after a brutal storm. There are even brief moments scattered throughout the early episodes where characters hear the angel land on their rooftops. But then miracles start to happen, the first one with wheelchair-bound Lisa, who's suddenly able to walk. Lisa was accidentally shot by town drunk Joe Collier, paralyzing her from the waist down. But the miracles keep on coming. Mildred, an elderly woman suffering from Alzheimer's, becomes younger and her disease disappears. Other characters de-age as well. Take a look at this comparison of Annie Flynn here from the first to last episode. Her eyesight has gotten better, and her husband Ed's back no longer has pain, allowing him to dance with her for the first time in ages. 
This sudden uptick in miracles has been what resident Bible thumper Beverly Keene calls a full-blown religious revival. It seems like everything is going well on Crockett, but as we'll soon find out, all good things must come to an end. These quote-unquote miracles are the result of the angel blood, which Father Paul has been secretly putting into the communion wine. This is why some characters never experience a miracle or resurrect after being killed. They never partake in communion, like Riley or Joe Collier, and for those wondering, yes, we will get into Riley in a bit. In episode 6, most of the town has joined the church for midnight mass. Even the sheriff's son, who was a devout Muslim, has seemingly converted because he believes the miracles to be of the Christian God, which, as the sheriff states earlier in the season, is silly because Muslims, Jews, and Christians all share the same God. They just refer to him or her by different names. Allah, Yahweh, God. Paul, along with a few others who know his secret of actually being Father Pruitt, intend to lock off the island so they they can transform all the believers into these vampiric beings, ones that can never die. Paul believes many things. First, that these miracles can only come from God. So by giving people these miracles, he's doing God's work. Second, he believes that God's will can change. We see how God's will has changed from the Old Testament to Jesus' covenant, also known as the New Testament. And now we have a third covenant. What's happening on this island tonight is the birth of God's new vision for the world. Just like he had a new vision for it with the creation of Adam and Eve, and a newer one with the birth of Christ. He calls on his congregation to be the first soldiers in God's army, to create a world where there are no borders or flags, where we are all one. So, it is a war, and there will be casualties, and we must be soldiers. There's just one caveat. In order to become this immortal being, you have to make a sacrifice. You have to die. The final transformation will not be yours unless you let your earthly body die so that your divine body can awaken. I guess Father Paul forgot suicide is a sin in the Catholic religion, but again, that just points to my theory that the angel isn't an angel at all. I want to briefly describe how this angel blood process works, because it can get confusing on who has powers, who doesn't, and why some people resurrect and others do not. Angel blood is the key to everything. When Father Prude is attacked by the angel, the angel gives to him his blood in return. This allows him to heal at a rapid rate. But Paul hasn't gone through the final transformation yet, death. He didn't die in those ruins. His death doesn't happen until the end of episode 3. This is why he's able to attend the church potluck in the sun, while later on he'll die if the sun's rays touch him. You see, the one weakness of both the angel and the vampires is that they burn in sunlight. What allows one to resurrect from a death is the angel's blood, the same blood he's been spiking the communion wine with. So those who didn't partake in communion will die for good if they are killed. Those who've been coming to church and taking communion, they have nothing to fear tonight. As for the rest of them, let God sort them out. But even if you haven't received the blood through communion, there is another way to resurrect. Such is the case of Howard Hobbs, who Sturge fed off and then gave him his own blood so he could resurrect. This resulted in poor Howard killing his wife and children when he awoke in a state of bloodlust. But because they didn't have the angel blood in them and he didn't know about giving them blood, they died for good. Speaking of blood, Sarah Gunning, the town doctor, finds that some of her patients' blood samples burst into flames while in sunlight so she does some of her own research. In episode 6, she discovers a blood disorder called erythropoietic protoporphyria, or EPP for short, a disorder which causes its infected to become anemic and photosensitive. Anemia just means a deficiency in red blood cells, which is why we see Father Paul collapse a bunch and why he needs blood to sustain himself. Blood is high in iron, which is used to create the protein hemoglobin found in those red blood cells. Sarah suggests that this EPP, or at least something like it, has been given to the townsfolk. It could even even have been what caused Aaron's baby to disappear in her womb, causing the body to basically destroy it. So now Aaron has a personal vendetta against Father Paul for killing the thing that she said saved her life. Aaron ran away from Crockett at the age of 16. She had an abusive mother and wound up marrying a man just like her mom, a drunk and abuser. So when she found out she was pregnant, she ran back to Crockett. She wasn't going to go through the hell of raising a child with a man who espoused the same characteristics of her evil mother. She says this pregnancy saved her life. She saved me, and now she's just gone.
and Aaron's story gets at the core of one of Midnight Mass's main themes. What is our purpose? Why do things happen the way they do? Cause and effect? And there is no better character that encapsulates this than Riley Flynn. Riley was a rich guy in the startup business who one night in an alcoholic stupor gets in a car crash and kills an innocent young girl, Tara Beth. By the way, the actress who voices the judge in this scene here is none other than Flanagan fave Carla Gugino. Riley ends up spending the next four years in jail and moves back with his family on Crockett where he tells Aaron his life is meaningless because he has no purpose. I have no money, no prospects. I just, I just exist. That's it. I have absolutely no purpose at all. But that's where Riley is wrong. Everything and everyone has a purpose. He just hasn't realized this yet. God can take that pain and turn it into something good, something with purpose. If Riley never killed that poor girl, he never would have made it back to Crockett. If he never made it back to Crockett, he never would have been killed by the angel and turned into a vampire, just like Father Paul. And if he never turned into a vampire, he'd never sacrifice himself, burning up in front of Aaron, prompting her to destroy the religious vampires, thus saving the world. Ooh, that's a lot to take in. This all points back to Aaron's story. If she was never pregnant, she too would have never made it back to Crockett. It points at some master hand guiding these characters along. Which leads to some of the more weightier themes of the season. In the final episode, all of Aaron's choices have led her to the moment where she burns down the rec center, the final place of refuge for the vampires to hide before the sun rises. The vampires idiotically have gone and burned the entire town down in an attempt to kill the non-believers, Beverly equating it to the four fourth bowl of revelation in which the world is consumed by fire. The fourth angel poured his bowl upon the sun and it was allowed to scorch men with fire. This would be their downfall as Aaron and the sheriff burn the rec center, leaving nowhere for them to hide from the sunlight. The angel ends up attacking Aaron and feeding off her blood, but what the angel doesn't realize is that Aaron is cutting holes through its wings, severely limiting its ability to fly. We saw earlier in the episode that while the angel feeds, it's almost impossible to break him out of his bloodlust. Lisa even shoots it while feeding it and it barely acknowledges her. But as Aaron slowly dies, we get this contemplative monologue from her through voiceover, which tackles such heavy questions as what is God, where do we go when we die, and what is heaven? Let's try to tackle these one by one. What is heaven? In traditional Christian theology, heaven is a place where the souls of the good live for eternity. But for Aaron, there is no heaven and there is no hell. Heaven and hell are what we make them on earth. And that's what we mean when we say heaven. No mansions, no rivers of diamonds or fluffy clouds or angel wings. You are loved. And you aren't alone. That is God. That is heaven. But what does that mean if we die? Where do we go? Quite simply, we go back to Earth as dust, to feed the great cosmos in a never-ending cycle of life and death, to be repeated over and over again. Aaron, remember you are dust and to dust you shall return. It's fitting that the final shot of the series is of the dust of the townsfolk literally falling back to Earth. Riley understood this. This is why his letter to Paul after he dies reads, Remember you are dust, and to dust you shall return. It flies in the face of Paul's belief of the afterlife. So if we're all just dust, then what is life? Aaron equates our fleeting moment here on Earth as a dream. Life is a dream. Aaron says we never remember our dreams. Thus, when we die, we won't remember our time here. We are merely in an infinite cycle of life and death, birth and rebirth, strung together by infinite dreams. And that's what we're talking about when we say God, the cosmos, and its infinite dreams. We are the cosmos dreaming of itself. It's simply a dream that I think is my life. We always forget our dreams, and we will forget our lives, but it will repeat again. Dreams play an important part in the series, perhaps for none more so than Riley, who tells Aaron in his dream he can never see past the horizon. This is because he never makes it past this moment. He burns into flames. For him, his dream ends here. Paul even says in episode 4 about life, Maybe it is a dream, <laughs> but if it is, we're, we're, we're all having it. 
In the final episode, Paul turns his back on what he believed was God's plan and exclaims that he was wrong. He has seen the townspeople turn into ravenous bloodsuckers and the violence and pain it has caused. This is why when he catches his daughter dousing the church in gasoline, he helps her. Years ago, Father Paul had an affair with Mildred and they had Sarah, but they kept this a secret. This is why Sarah talks about how Paul always strangely looks at her. It's not because she's a lesbian and he looks down on her, it's because he's a father who has to live with the hell of watching his daughter grow up without being her father. Sturge, one of the devout followers, shoots Sarah as she plans to light the church on fire, and Paul goes to her side, giving her his blood so that she may live. But Sarah denies it. She would rather die than turn into a vampire. Paul's arc ends when he himself burns the church, choosing to die alongside his two loves, Mildred and his daughter. Ali and the sheriff work their way to the beach to pray in the traditional Muslim fashion facing Mecca. Ali has turned back to Islam after witnessing the horror of what his new religion has brought. Bev, arguably the most evil of all the characters, awaits her death. For a person who so strongly wants to make it to heaven, she sure doesn't want to go, even clawing away at the sand, making Annie's statement a few hours earlier extra fitting. We all say there's a heaven. Then we claw, fight, and beg for a few more minutes at the end. And as all the vampires await their death by sunrise, we get one of the final themes of the series, forgiveness. Forgiveness is something many of the characters yearn for. Joe Collier is forgiven by Lisa, but also needs to learn to forgive himself. Father Paul asks Mildred for her forgiveness. Sturge, so longing for forgiveness from anyone for the evil he has committed, asks Uker. And finally, there's Riley, a man so wrought up in the guilt of killing an innocent girl he can't forgive himself, nor ask for forgiveness from the girl he killed since she's dead. That is until his final moment. As Riley dies, we see him on the boat with Tara Beth, and she extends her hand to him in a moment I interpret as forgiveness. The two hold hands, and it's hauntingly beautiful. The only remaining survivors of Crockett Island that we know of are Lisa and Warren, who have made it off the island. There's also the angel that haphazardly attempts to make it to the mainland with its clipped wings, which is ironic since Aaron, the girl who cut his wings, tells a story about how her mother made her hold pigeons as a child while she cut their wings. Mainland is 30 miles from the island, and it is assumed that the angel would not have been able to make it before the sun rises. However, we never actually see it die. The final line does offer some clues. Lisa, who was infused with angel blood giving her the ability to walk again, tells Warren, I can't feel my legs. This could mean that the angel blood in her body has simply dissipated, or because it coincides exactly with the sunrise, that the angel has died, causing all the quote-unquote miracles to reverse. Either way, Midnight Mass ends in tragedy. Almost everyone has died, but I can't help but see a glimmer of hope here. A lot of the characters saw the error of their ways. The angel and vampires were stopped, and it gave me hope that there will always be people who will stand up against religious zealotry. But what did you think of Midnight Mass? I literally finished the entire season in one day and have had no one to talk to about it so I want to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching everyone, be sure to like and subscribe and for more bad takes you can always follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time remember, Daddy loves you very much.